Hi and hello there. My name is Ian McLeod and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Australasian Corrosion Association Foundation. And what we're trying to do is bring to you some of the amazing stories of shipwrecks uh, located in and around the Western Australian coast. I worked for the Western Australian Museum for 38 years and really I owe my whole career to a massacre that took place on Beacon Island in 1629. The image on the screen shows you a 1630 sketch done by the commander of the Batavia, uh, Francisco Pelsa, and it showed a depiction of what happened when he went in the longboat with crew up from Western Australia, from the Abrolhos Islands to Java to get a rescue ship. While he was away, half the full complement of the Batavia were murdered. They were otherwise uh, had their throats chopped, speared, uh, heads cut off, uh, and generally put to death. Why? It was because they were worried about supplies and particularly water. And so the mad chemist in charge was a guy called Geronimus Cornelius. And it was his plan to cut the numbers of people in half. And that's exactly what he did. And in, in the whole business of corrosion and conservation, it's very hard often to get an idea of what is the impact of the microenvironment on the rates of decay. So in this slide, we've got two astrolabes. These were navigational instruments in the 17th century used for determining your degree of latitude. Longitude was by dead reckoning. And the astrolabe on the left was exposed to the full energy in the surf 350 years. And you can see that the bronze got pretty heavily corroded. The astrolabe on the other hand, on the right hand side, you can just make out the date 1628, the year of manufacture, plus all the details of the engravings of the numbers that helped you work out your latitude. This astrolabe was in fact buried inside a, a concretion that is a marine growth conglomerate due to cannonballs corroding nearby, and it protected this astrolabe from the ravages of the surf. So if you want to see the difference between a good and a bad storage environment, look no further than seeing these two Batavia astrolabes. Where the timbers were buried underneath structure of the ship, and under cannonballs and cannon, the wave action, and more particularly the Torito, the wood boring mollusk, could not uh, get in because they need oxygen, well oxygenated water to thrive. So in front of you, you see the curve of the fashion piece, the shape of the stern on the port side, and the vertical elements are in fact the horizontal transom beams. And that's what is left of the Batavia. And underneath the burial environment, bacteria eat the cellulose in the oak. And so they go and say, Mum, what's for breakfast? <clears throat> oak. What's for dinner? Oak. What's for supper? Oak. What do I eat when I'm watching TV? Oak. And so after 350 years, they'd eaten an awful lot of the cellulose out of the wood. And it contains 450% water. That is when you weigh a piece of timber uh, and then dry it out in the oven overnight, there's roughly the wet weight is four and a half times the dry weight. And as you dry it, the whole timber structure collapses a bit like a carrot shrinking down um, in the bottom of the fridge when you go away for two months and leave it there. 
So what we have to do as conservators and chemists is to impregnate the timbers with polyethylene glycol, a water-soluble polymer. And so what that does, it dries the water out and stops the timber collapsing. The view on the left is in fact me uh, inside a dirty PEG treatment tank when the pump circulating and pumping the PEG liquid to another tank failed. And we had to climb in there and very quickly remove the timbers before the wax set solid. And uh, on the image on the right, you can see the scallop looking surface. That's a piece of timber that was adzed, you know, trimmed to shape with an adz. And the one beside it, you can just make out the saw cuts. And that's the origin of the issue of whether you're top dog or bottom dog. If you were top dog, you had the job of standing on top of a soaring pit and moving your saw up and down. The bottom dog or the underdog, he got all his mouth full of sawdust and in his eyes because there were no safety goggles. And so you wanted to be top dog. The only problem with uh, the uh, getting the PEG over the top of my gumboots was by the time we got down to our other lab, it had frozen solid. So I had to lie on my back with my gumboots in the air under the shower until it all melted and, and then I could finally get my gumboots off. And the, there are some large cracks you can see in the timber and they were original 17th century drying cranes. And one of the things that's really interesting is looking at the corrosion rate of copper sheathing on these Dutch shipwrecks. And the image on the right shows you a bit of copper sheet from the Zeewick or the Zeewick, and it was corroding at 1.6 microns per year. And the one on the left is from the Batavia, which is corroding at one tenth that rate. Now, both these wrecks are pretty strong, surging ocean currents. And the question was why? And also, the smaller grains uh, promote intergranular corrosion. So, as the grain size diminishes, the corrosion rate goes up. And the white spots that you can see in the electron microscope image are in fact particles of lead that have been rolled and squished. And so you can tell that this sheet of copper was gone squished by a factor of four times to get it to its working thickness. So when we plotted the grain size of copper sheet against the corrosion rate, we found there was a, a very nice relationship that the corrosion rate is 2.16 times uh, minus 0.013 times the grain size. So therefore, uh, smaller grains leads to faster corrosion. But the orange dot on the screen shows you the corrosion rate on the Batavia. And you think, why, why is this so? And you've got to remember, there were dozens of iron cannon on board the Batavia. And even though many of them were covered with marine growth, the electrical environment of the corroding cannon was protecting this uh, sheet of copper on the Batavia without direct contact. So it was an example of what we call proximity corrosion, like galvanic corrosion, but it doesn't have to be in direct contact. I was presented with this image, well, <laughs> not just the image, but with a real uh, coin uh, from the Batavia shipwreck, and it was cracked. And the curator said to me, Ian, fix it. I said, I can't uncrack a cracked coin. He said, no, but work out why is it cracked and what happened to it. So we went and analyzed the composition of the layers of corrosion inside. 
and moving from the right, you had a lot of silver chloride, tin oxide, bit of sand, then a complex zinc tin hydroxide, metallic silver, cuprite, copper oxide, a mixed lead hydroxycarbonate, bit of iron, some antimony, and bit of bismuth, and a bit of nickel. So what was all this doing in an ostensibly copper silver alloy? It turned out that this was a genuine forged coin. The upper image shows you the corrosion products on the inside of the coin, and the image on the right shows you one whole surface of the coin. And so the graph shows you that the outer layer in red and black, uh, you know, the colors of Essendon Football Club, or maybe it's the Bombers, I don't know. I'm not a Victorian anymore. But anyway, the red and black squares shows you what the outer layers were like, pretty much the genuine composition for a coin. But the inner layer had only half as much silver in it, and a lot of tin, a lot of copper, and a lot of lead. So what was the story? Well, clearly the coin had corroded out from the uh, inside out. And why and how? When we looked at the electron microscope image of the surface of the coin, we found it was microporous. So someone had made a blank that only had 50% of the amount of silver expected in it. Then they etched it of the tin so that it would have the right look, the right taste, would have the right strength. And so they made the coin a little bit wider and a little bit thicker so it passed uh, the weight test, the bite test, and everything was genuine, except it wasn't. It was a genuine 1568 forgery made by King Philip uh, of Spain, Philip II of Spain, and minted in his mint in GEL in Gelderland. Why? Well, Philip was waging war against the Dutch. He wanted them to be Catholic, they wanted to be Protestant and war was expensive. So he was running out of dosh. So he just simply doubled his money overnight by making his own forgeries. And guess what? No one lost money in the deal because everyone who had these debased coins got full face value. Philip doubled his money and it was only 350 years of corrosion that showed up the corruption of King Philip II of Spain. Sadly, owing to the statute of limitations and to the fact that he's been dead for over 400 years, we can't prosecute him. But you know, when iron corrodes, it, the corrosion products of iron itself act as a growth stimulant for the encrusting marine organisms that you can see on the right hand side. So these are routinely taken off to help the chloride salts get released as we wash the deconcreted cannon on the left uh, in uh, tanks and attach anodes to drive the chlorides out. But what was really interesting was looking at the extent of corrosion of the iron cannon that had been recovered from the wreck. And the numbers you see on the left-hand image in bold print uh, in the middle of the map, 18, that means 18 millimeters of graphitization or corrosion. And next to it is a cannon that was 58 millimeters. Then below that, 24, 29, 44, 44, and 36. And when we plot the extent of corrosion, uh, against the distance from the bow anchor, which is in the top left-hand side of the image, then you can see that there's a direct relationship between the amount of corrosion and the increase in distance from the bow. And the plot below shows you where the wreck site is on the edge of the reef, 
but, uh, and also the distance they had to swim to get to the island where half of them, of course, got massacred. And the reason why uh, the iron cannon are corroding much faster down near the stern of the ship is because that's where the water is deeper and where the full thrust of the ocean waves comes, boom, crash, bang, and goes and makes the metal corrode. The unusual cannon uh, that was in fact at 58 millimetres of corrosion, cannon number 13, it was found lying on a pedestal of coral. And so the water was always swirling around it and giving it maximum corrosion. And so even though the iron cannon uh, all went into the ocean at the same time, there's a difference of three and a half times almost with, between the least and the most corroded. Inside the Shipwreck Museum in Fremantle, there is a skeleton uh, as shown in this picture here. And the gentleman had had his throat cut, uh, there's a chip out of his skull, and also he'd had his scapula chopped in half. And he was very dead and it was found in the excavations on Beacon Island. And the museum had uh, sent the skull for forensic analysis and they'd shown a mock-up of the skull. And I had a visitor the, to Gerd de Vries um, in 2009, a Dutch minister of commerce. And I said to him, I'm sure I've seen your face before. He said, you couldn't have. And I said, ah, you look like Andre de Vries because that's the man they believe is the skeleton. And so I put the computer simulation and the mock-up of the face of our massacre victim side by side with his photograph. And he wrote back and he said, yes, I am from the same family and you've picked up our bone structure. So talk about the chance of finding that out just by uh, being in the right place at the right time. But look, not everything with corrosion is bad. The object in the middle is a bronze cascable, the button at the end of a composite gun. And it's got a very unusual composition, a little bit of tin, a lot of lead, a lot of arsenic, a lot of antimony, and it had corroded one and a half millimetres in 350 years. The door pintle on the right and the cannon uh, on the left had suffered very extensive corrosion. And that was because the telltale high concentration of iron Iron impurities get into uh, ca uh, bronze cannon and bronze fittings whenever the gun is recycled. And because the spaces between the two halves of the mold are called chaplets and they're made of iron. So we can tell from these analyses that in fact, that cannon number 3638 had been not once, twice, but three times recycled in the early 17th century. So what we're doing is nothing new. However, the bronze cascabel uh, was, was a cracker for non-corrosion. And so uh, a water authority in New South Wales used that composition for creating a bronze diffuser at their ocean uh, outfall for their sewer line because they wanted to know Will this corrode? And I said, no, nope. it'll last for four to 500 years. Occasionally, things go wrong in conservation. The image of this uh, cherub was after uh, a trainee conservator had left it too long in a treatment solution and sil metallic silver from the corroded metal on the back of it had deposited all over the surface of the angel. 
and I thought about the problem long and hard. And then I thought, ah, we can actually make corrosion work for us. So if we paint the cherub, the silver colored cherub with a gold solution carefully under the microscope, the gold solution will grab the electrons from the silver, it'll go into solution and the gold will be deposited. And that is exactly what happened. And so we were able to re-restore the original gold back into great condition. In Western Australia, uh, where I initially gave this talk in Geraldton, uh, there's a local steamship 50 nautical miles north called the Xantha, and it was wrecked in 1872. And this series of isometric sketches going from upper left to right, then down below, and then ending up in the left lower left side shows you how a ship, uh, an iron ship, will gradually decay over time. So this expedition was led by Dr. Mac McCarthy, who you can see here, getting ready to check out all the gear. And it was the first time we'd done uh, a really complete systematic in situ corrosion study on an iron shipwreck and also a biological and a chemical and environmental survey. And what it showed us was that the Xantho was in fact uh, the world's only surviving example of the first mass produced high pressure marine steam engine. And while many of you watching this might say, who cares? It's for car buffs, it's like finding the original first mass produced uh, T model Ford. And these engines were produced for the British uh, in their battles with the Russians in the Crimean War. And so we realized it was a very important piece of history. So we put some sacrificial anodes on while we got the money to build a treatment tank. In the end, it took us 25 years to fully conserve the engine that you see in its concreted form on the right hand side. But we were able to use the boiler, which we kept in situ and in position. We kept monitoring its voltage when we would go back uh, periodically to check on the site. And its voltage is rock steady at plus or minus three millivolts. Uh, that means the corrosion rate hasn't changed within an error of 2%. And Mac on the left said, I want to see inside the chest. I said, the museum doesn't have an endoscope. And Vicky in the background said, well, why don't you borrow one from a hospital? So I rang a friend in Fremantle Hospital, cycled up on my bicycle, borrowed the endoscope, uh, we did recording inside the engine, and then I cleaned it up in alcohol and uh, rode it back to the hospital. No one was the wiser, and we got a free service out of the health department. And we didn't have to drug the engine because it couldn't feel the endoscope going down inside its private bits. But one of the amazing things that happened when we pulled the cylinder out of one of these uh, engine trunks was you can see there there's uh, highlighted one angle uh, going from uh, upper right down to the lower left. Uh, that was the initial list of the ship to port. And the other angle, the straight line, shows uh, the angle it was recovered at. So these different corrosion lines told us that the ship had changed position between 1872 and, and 1982. So, you know, amazing what corrosion can tell you. And in fact, from the depth of corrosion of these difference in these two lines that we found in the airspace above the piston, we're able to tell you that it was about 20, 22 years uh, listening to port 
before it rolled over the other way. But also what corrosion and conservation can do is reveal huge amounts of information. The loss of HMA is Sydney too, with more than 640 people on board in 1941, was Australia's biggest maritime disaster in World War II. And my colleague, uh, Roger Neal at the Defence Laboratories in Melbourne, he looked at the underwater footage of the Sydney and worked out exactly what had happened to the warship as it sank and how the bow came off, hit the bridge as it came back past and the vessel sank. Roger matched up every shell hole with a specific gun and position on the cormorant. So even though he wasn't there in 1941, he was able 70 years later to work out who had fired the crippling shots. And the, here is a view of the Sydney uh, on the seabed bottom at 2,468 uh, uh, metres below, that is roughly two and a half kilometres. And it's sitting on the ocean floor. You can see at the bottom, there's the teak deck in good condition and a little bit of rust uh, and a lot of the original paint still in condition. But the only marine growth growing on it uh, is soft bodied uh, anemones and tunicates. And that's because at that depth, calcium carbonate is too soluble. And so it can't form a protective skin around the Sydney. And if you look at this chart, you'll see the water depth of 2480 metres for the Sydney and around about uh, 3,800 metres for the Titanic. And the red orange line is the solubility product for calcium carbonate. And that goes up and up and up the deeper you get. But the ionic product, that is concentration of all the ions in seawater, changes. And once you get below about 300 metres, the ionic product is below the solubility product, so no protective concretion can form. And that's why you will see a face mask and a pair of shoes separated by the length of what was once a human body, because under these conditions, cold water and great depth, our human bones dissolve. But an interesting case of applied decay where we can't take sections of the metal is with the story of the Hartog plate, which Dirk Hartog in 1616, uh, he was a skipper of the VOC ship, the Endracht, and he came across Dirk Hartog Island and the little red tag shows you where he left a flattened out uh, pewter dinner plate. And what he did, he left a note saying, you yeah, know, I was here on the 25th of October in 1616. We hang around here for a couple of days and then we left on the 27th to go to Bantam uh, in Indonesia, what's now Indonesia. And so he nailed it to a rottenest island pine post and left it at Cape Inscription for 80 years until the Dutch explorer Willem de Vlaming came along. He saw it, thought, fantastic. What a, what a record of our VOC company. So he copied out the inscription and put it on um, his own plate. But here is a view of the Hartog plate looking a bit worse for wear it taken in 1897. So we had the situation that the plate was on a tour of Australia and we got a grant from the synchrotron to go and look with their X-ray fluorescence uh, machine uh, at the composition and nature of the plate. 
Now, to give you an idea, the synchrotron belts up and the electrons are going around faster and faster till they're about uh, 30, 40% the speed of light. And then they go ching and shoot them off through targets into your plate. And this is a view, X-ray view of the Hartog plate. You can see the date 1616 and look at all the cracks in it. It's, it's a mess and so very, very fragile. In similar, the K patterns were found on the de Vlaming plate, which we had a tiny fragment we could analyze under the electron microscope. It was about 85% tin, 15% lead with a bit of you know, copper and zinc. But the Hartog plate had been extensively repaired. The left image shows you uh, when all the paint coloring had been taken off and it shows massive amounts of epoxy. And the X-ray image shows it even more clearly. And the problem is epoxies expand with time. And so the epoxy, instead of holding the plate together, was going and wanting to pull it apart. So that was carefully removed and then uh, it was put back together. And that's, that's the view of the plate uh, as it's reassembled, sitting on its support. And we looked at the pattern of decay and it was similar to that on the de Vlaming plate. And you can see uh, the scalloped uh, breakouts. And that's because the post had been nailed to a piece of timber and the winds up on Dirk Hartog Island can be very strong and pewter is soft. So the plate's going boom, 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 and it gradually cracks up. And the environment, even though we weren't there to record it, because you know, huh, I'm only 72 years old and not a few hundred years old, we know from Shark Bay that you get over 2.2 meters of evaporation a year, whereas the rainfall is 142 millimeters. So that means the plate was corroding in a saturated salt environment. And what we found, thanks to the synchrotron with its incredible power, we found all these little white, white highlights at the edge of the cracks and their strontium from the seawater, which is selectively absorbed on corroding tin. And also, Phosphate was found in those areas. So we could tell that this damage occurred within the first uh, 15 to 20 years of corrosion of the plate uh, up on Dirk Hartog Island. And we notice in this uh, lead density image that there was uh, unusual patterns of concentration of lead, the lighter colored material. And yet right around the flow lines away from the iron nails, the lead was depleted. And that's because the iron corrosion products had etched the pewter uh, of a lot of its lead content. And so everyone had said there is no, there are no hallmarks on the uh, plate on the heart of plate, nothing there. And so the synchrotron image found a beautiful crowned rose hallmark uh, or pewterous mark on the plate just below the 1616. And this is the earliest recorded uh, mark of that symbol on a Dutch artifact ever re recorded. And a lot of people had written books and theses about, oh, the Dutch used shorthand in their script on the Hartog plate because they used the word S-C-H-I as a shorthand for the word ship, S-C-H-I-P. But the synchrotron went and showed up that 
right on the edge of the broken bit, uh, there was the missing letter P. So it was hiding all the time. And at three o'clock in the morning, because we worked uh, 24 hours a day, I came in uh, for my second shift and I couldn't believe my eyes because here was this image on the screen. Now, I hope you'll share some of my joy uh, because the red color is germanium, which is above tin uh, in the periodic table. And the green is arsenic, which is often found in association with lead. And the beauty of this image is that these elements are concentrated at the edges of the grain boundaries. So in a non-destructive way, we've been able to look at the microstructure of the hardhog plate just through a study of the germanium and arsenic impurities in the alloy. And I think that is just so brilliant because what we can see is these relatively long crystals near the edge of the plate and shorter crystals in the middle. And we can see the distortion that was brought about when they hammered the plate flat. And so the synchrotron team uh, was Tamar Davidovitz on the left, the brilliant uh, young conservator from the Reichs Museum, David Thorogood, a private conservator, David Patterson and Daryl Hard from the Synchrotron, uh, Dudley Cray from the University of Canberra and the late David Hallam uh, from uh, Queensland. So it's something that can be done. And many people think, say, oh, corrosion is boring. Let me tell you, it's rip roaring fun because it enables you when you've got the right instruments at the right time with the right team to go and peel back the layers of history. So uh, we've come to the end almost of this presentation, but you've got to look at this watch. It's a pocket watch from the wreck of HMS Pandora that was wrecked in 1791 in Torres Strait off the Queensland coast. And you can see the left hand image shows you part way through conservation after we'd opened it up. And the right hand image shows you the beautiful uh, fire gilded brass uh, fittings, plus the name of the manufacturer, J and J Jackson of London, watch number 9866. The horological guild in London was able to tell us that this watch was sold to the surgeon on board the Pandora. And the numbers uh, above the silver escapement, gold escapement, you can see other numbers of the days of the month. And on the reverse face of the watch, you had naturally a minute hand and an hour hand, but this was one of the earliest watches that had a second sweep hand. And so it was going tick, 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 and the surgeon was recording in his notebook the time and the pulse and the health of the officers and crew and prisoners on board uh, who were the mutineers from the bounty that had been recovered in Tahiti. Fortunately, the surgeon survived the shipwreck. His watch did not, uh, but he got back to England and wrote up uh, so we're led to believe the first papers on the correlation of pulse and health. And the late Hugh Whitwell, a watchmaker in Perth, his great grandfather had been a watchmaker. And guess what? He found matching iron screws and springs and all the bits, new hands. And the watch now works again after a couple of hundred years in the sea and is on display in the Museum of Tropical Queensland in Townsville. So that is a nice story on which to end. Corrosion does a great service for the community, except we want to control it.
but more importantly, from a museum and decay conservation point of view, you learn an awful lot about how to manage things in the future by studying things from the past. Thank you very much. So this talk was brought to you by the Australasian Corrosion Association Foundation. Thank you.